next session will be on cross-industry applications of big data. The moderator for this session is Adam Christensen. He's a senior VP of enterprise data and analytics at Wells Fargo, and he'll introduce the other panelists. So you'll Thank sit you. here and Rajiv and yeah. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, of course, we're separating you and lunch, so we will try to uh, really keep this moving. We're, our, our commitment is to make this worth your while, and it's certainly um, an honor to be with you at this conference. Um, we, we're not going to do a lot of bio sort of work. We, uh, you, can, you can check that out, but we want to dive in as, uh, as quickly as we can into the heart of some of the discussion here. Uh, and, and really the first, the first question, and, and I'll answer as well, representing really financial services and Wells Fargo, and I, I run uh, the big data and the, our enterprise big data solutions for Wells Fargo. Um, you know, what, what we're doing, and, and we'll ask each of the, the panelists, you know, what are you doing? What business problems are you solving right now using big data capabilities, big, big data technologies? So from, from our perspective, we are doing a few things, um, a lot in parallel, actually. I think uh, at the heart of what we're, we're solving is really taking our multi-channel interactions to the next level. Um, that is uh, something where you know, we've done a lot of analytics for, for decades, um, but in, in uh, very business-focused ways, and our customers are, you know, their expectations are extremely high now about not just the ability to interact with Wells Fargo um, uh, on a multi-channel basis, but at each channel interaction to, to uh, have the expectation that we have, we have the knowledge of what they've been doing in other channels at that, at that touch point. And uh, it's taking a lot of, of effort and time to operationalize some of the insights that we get and, and this, this uh, massive amount of data that we, that we have from our customers. Um, so that's, that's one, is around the multi-channel um, customer interactions. Um, we've also found that, that uh, criminals are also multi-channel criminals <laughs> as well, and that, uh, and that, that, that uh, you know, a lot of the patterns that we've been able to detect in the past around certain silos um, now are, are still valid, but there's a lot more sophistication. And for us, big data technologies have allowed us to really explore and find new patterns and, um, and new ways of, of really preventing and detecting and preventing fraud um, you know, tens of millions of dollars we're able to prevent um, through these sorts of capabilities. So that's a, that's a massive effort for us. And uh, I think in general, using big data technologies as, as a lot more uh, discovery type platform to accelerate time to answer, time to really understand. Um, those, are, those are some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, I'd like to uh, ask Dave here from Disney, what, what, are you guys, what, what problems are you guys solving with uh, big data technologies? Uh, so I work for the part of Disney that makes uh, video games, Disney Interactive. So we are, we are using big data to try to make uh, better video games, and, and in particular games um, that you will want to pay us for. Um, so we make games that you can play on Facebook, um, that you can play on your mobile phones, or that you can play on, on console, uh, and each sends data in, in very different ways. Um, one, of, one of the first challenges is just finding, uh, marketing the games to people. Uh, it costs money to put ads on Facebook. It costs money to put ads on mobile platforms. Uh, if the people coming through those ads are not um, going to pay as much as we pay for them, then, then we don't have a good business. And so uh, the first thing we use big data for is to try to rapidly estimate the value of the customers um, coming through marketing channels so that we can kind of optimize what we pay there. Uh, and then. The second thing is it's important to have a game that people actually like when they get there. Uh, so data is flowing in to let us do things like figure out if some of the levels in a mobile game are too hard and everyone's leaving and, and unhappy and so they won't upgrade to a, to a paid version because of that. Um, so uh, product managers can, can see that sort of data in tune. Uh, and then I think the third thing is just to provide insights for uh, the next variations in games that, that people will try. A lot of that comes from understanding how people are behaving in the products. Uh, and then we try to test 
uh, you know, if you put in variation X or variation Y, uh, is, is one better? Do the people who experience Y go on to uh, play more games over the next month or not? Uh, those, those are examples of, of how we use data. Very interesting. Rajiv, how about you? Netflix, um, what are you guys up to? So I'm part of a data science and engineering group at Netflix, and a uh, couple of big problems that we are trying to solve uh, or are uh, working on, very similar to what Dave said, we want to make sure there are obviously more customers that uh, sign up for Netflix. But once they have signed up, we want to make sure that they have enough good content to watch. And we leverage our data to work on our recommendation engine. I'm pretty sure most of you, uh, if you're a member of Netflix, have seen a lot of good recommendations uh, come based on what you watched or what you like and what your preferences are. And that's, I think, the biggest area where we leverage uh, data to understand what customers really like. And a lot of algorithm work and a lot of heavy lifting happens at the back end to make sure we show you the right set of recommendations. And eventually that drives uh, viewing. That means retention and word of mouth and then eventually more customers. So big problems, I mean, um, definitely more acquisition, more retention, more viewing. And also another big area where Netflix spends a lot of money, as you guys know, I mean, it's buying content. Um, now, we need to figure out what content's working. What are people watching? Uh, what are they liking? What's the next thing you've got to predict? What are they going to like? And how much to pay for that? That's another area where we kind of manage our spend, uh, pick the right set of movies and shows that people are going to watch. Um, other areas very similar to, I think, what you were mentioning. I mean, fraudsters are everywhere. We recently launched uh, our service in Latin America, uh, Mexico uh, for particular. I mean, a lot of fraud in that area. So just looking at patents and data and then figuring out where fraud's happening and plugging those holes. I mean, they come up with new ways to uh, game the system, but you always got to be kind of on top of it and uh, keep plugging those holes as, they, as you uh, identify them. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so Ari Gesher from Palantir, you guys are solution providers in this area. What are, what are the, the meaty problems that you guys are solving? Yeah, I mean, space? for us, I mean, the, the, the list really kind of runs the gamut. You know, our, our model is that we, we package up different pieces of technology with our own proprietary sauce into sort of a product offering that can be applied in, in sort of different, different verticals, different horizontals. So um, we do a lot of work in anti-fraud. Um, we're working with some big pharma companies on helping them integrate their data across their research pipelines to understand how to not repeat work. Um, our biggest growing area currently is actually probably cybersecurity and how to integrate all the data from all the different network sensors, uh, as well as information from outside the network to effectively shut down these kinds of intrusions. Um, and then we have you know, what we call our traditional work with sort of intelligence agencies uh, and the military. But then we've also been moving into uh, local law enforcement, sort of enabling uh, the, the sort of the regional fusion centers to bring in all the possible data they have about an incident to very quickly respond to things. At the same time, under sort of the rubric of philanthropy, uh, with the Clinton Global Initiative, we're actually working on building a disaster recovery solution, uh, which can manage information in those sort of precious days and weeks after a natural disaster to effectively use resources to, to actually recover things very, very quickly. Um, and that's, that's kind of just a, you know, our, our basic approach is that we build this, this raw capability in the form of products, these sort of empty vessels that can be applied to many different problems. And then we go searching for different places and different industries where they can be used. Um, and once we have a sort of a good solution, uh, we then sort of shop it around to all the different players. It's actually interesting, a lot of the work that you're, you're sort of describing at Wells Fargo, we've helped do the, those sorts of anti-fraud workflows at other banks. So it's uh, peas in a pod, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk. Let's talk future. You know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs here, and um, you know, where where do you see things going? What are the problems that you see coming? Uh, what are those that those 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 big areas, those big topics that that you're you're heading toward in each of your scopes of purview? I mean, for us at Wells, I think one of the one of the biggest sea changes, or an even cultural change, that, uh, that 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 we see coming is really this V for velocity, um, in terms of 
you know, really the boundaries between operational and analytical are really blurring quickly. Um, some of the laws of, of physics that applied before, now um, there, there's an extraordinary amount of opportunity within memory, with other types of possibilities here um, with big data. Um, so really the ability to really think differently, to turn data into customer value a lot more quickly as opposed to just seeing it as something that you analyze and you know are able to see you know 30 60 90 days out of uh, the patterns trends um, it's it's a lot more about what can i give back to my customers today given the interactions that i've, I've had with them you know that's that's something that uh, is in the forefront of my mind um, thinking about that um, you know rajiv how about you guys and netflix where so, where's this uh, going so, I mean, as I said, I mean, we leverage uh, our data very heavily and it's growing. I mean, that's one of the areas we're uh, focused on. Um, it's about tens of uh, billions of events that we capture every day. And we have a few petabytes of data today and it's growing very, very rapidly. I mean, there are a set of tools that are out there and it's evolving, but that's one area where we're always looking for uh, new tools, technologies that can make uh, performance of either processing all of that easier, visualization of that data somewhat easier, uh, enabling our analyst community to be able to self-serve a lot of that. Because right now, I think just given the amount of data and the maturity of this platform, a lot of work's happening in data science or analytics organizations, and we want to make sure, uh, take it to the next level. So performance is one. Um, Second area, I'd just say, I mean, just one of the challenges we're uh, facing right now uh, is finding talent. This is evolving so rapidly and always looking for uh, smart people to take it to the next level. Yeah. Ari? I mean, what we've seen out in the market when we, when we talk to different customers um, about their pain is sort of, uh, everyone is entranced by the potential for of big data. Um, you know, the, the cost of infrastructure is, is trending towards zero. Uh, th there's an incredible amount of free tooling and sort of software that's available to solve these problems. And I, to echo what you said, I think uh, talent is the big missing piece. Uh, that, that even though the, the potential is real, the distance between the, the, the dream and the reality it usually involves a lot of very smart people who have a lot of different jobs chasing them, right? I mean, I just read an article that said something like there's 160,000 unfilled basically data science jobs in the United States, and that number is expected to like triple in the next five years. Um, and so I think the, the opportunity is to, to for, for entrepreneurs um, is to, to bake whatever they can into a product that removes the need for talent at these organizations if you don't have to build it yourself, mm -hmm. right? And one of, the, one of the biggest missing pieces, I think, in the entire big data ecosystem, even though you need talent to figure out how to put together the infrastructure just to do the processing, um, is the user interface. Yeah. Is that even if you have the right team who can do the systems engineering, who can do the data science, the interface to your analysts is usually another person, yeah. right? So, or maybe a dashboard if they're lucky, right? Yeah. Rather than any way to get direct exposure to the data. And so um, there's a, I think there's a huge opportunity in building compelling interactive uh, user interface that connects the people who know the most about the problems, the sort of subject matter experts that are not big data experts at all. If you give them a database query prompt, they have no idea what to do with it. But if you, put their, if you give them their data in a form that they can readily understand, they can, they can leverage the hell out of it. Yeah. Dave? I mean, we, I think we see the same, same sorts of things. Uh, interface for us is, is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Uh, and the interface actually has to solve a lot of problems because we, so if we take product managers in our Palo Alto office working on Facebook games, uh, they can run their own SQL against the data warehouse. Um, they push changes to their code every few days. Um, if we take someone working on a console game uh, in Los Angeles, it's, uh, it's a, uh, the development time scales are much longer. They're used to having data handed to them, usually from market research teams, right. not from not behavioral data taken from other products. Uh, and so there's sort of uh, a need to have uh, intermediate products that not, they're not really spoon feed data, but feed data a little more easily to folks um, who are still coming up on sort of the, the uh, tech and comfort level with, with big data, um, but also will allow people who are really comfortable and, and savvy to go deep. And, and we don't, we're struggling to build those. 
Uh, so, so yeah, we could definitely use help from entrepreneurs in the in the audience. It, yeah, I mean, just to just to give you sort of a, a vision into how we think about this problem, uh, we probably have 300 core engineers who work just on the software product in the abstract in Palo Alto, another 200 out in the field. I would say over half of them are focused purely on user interface, um, because to deliver the kind of interactive tools that we do, it requires an incredible amount of user experience engineering. Uh, along, I mean, you can't neglect the data plumbing part of things, right. the analytic part, the algorithmic right. part, but um, the other half, literally the other half of that equation is user interface. Certainly a massive trend in the industry, yeah. yeah. I, I would say another piece that we are really trying to, to figure out on some of these new platforms. I mean, with any disruptive technology, you're not gonna, you know, you're, there's gonna be new, new ways of delivering, uh, new price points, that sort of thing that are very exciting. Um, you're, you're not gonna get some of the same levels, uh, you know, a framework and tooling that you've had in existing technologies. And one of those areas uh, for us is around security and, you know, authorization, who can see what. And, and it, you know, if the trend is to, you know, put a lot more data into more common, less structured places, you know, who can see what is, is a really um, big challenge that we're trying to figure out, um, particularly on the Hadoop side, you know, we, we um, have, have more baked into the Aster side um, to, uh, to be able to leverage um, because we use both of those, those, those footprints. But, um, yeah. you know, that's a big deal to us. Um, it's very sensitive information. Uh, we have thousands of analysts that are, you know, want to be at the data, and and we need to have real uh, tight controls, uh, yeah. you know, for our customers' sake. Another another area that I want to mention. I mean, I, I mentioned kind of the performance of processing all of the data, but also, uh, if you look at traditional MPP databases, RDBMS, they've been tuned over years and stuff, and users expect a certain level of uh, performance. Yeah. So you run a query, and it's back in. 10 seconds, right, or, or a minute. And when you're parsing so much data, petabytes of data, you're obviously not gonna get that level of uh, query performance, just given the current uh, technology and tool set. So that's another big area where I, I know there are a lot of companies trying to solve that problem, but I, I see that area being uh, one where yeah, on the data innovation is gonna happen. We spend, a, we spend a lot of time figuring out what transformations we need to do statically to deliver interactive response. Um, and we spend a lot of, like we have, we've built a few tools that actually can, can, can work at about the terabyte scale and give you 10 second response times. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a lot of work to get there. Like that's, that, those are hard problems to solve. But once you've solved them, you actually, you enable a whole different level of analysis. I think if you can ask the next question in 10 seconds, if you can hold that train of thought, you're actually working on a completely different level than if you're in that sort of like 12 hour time frame. let's let the Hadoop job run overnight yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Dave, any other challenges or big pain points that you're having that, uh, that you'd like to see um, some of these folks solve? Well, I mean, for the entrepreneurs out there, the, the other big challenge that's going to uh, come to everybody who's collecting user-level data, which is what's generating the big data, is uh, privacy and anonymization and ways of handling the data that um, are consistent with kind of evolving uh, European standards, which are getting very strict, and evolving US standards, which get much stricter July 1. Um, that's a big challenge. I mean, particularly for us, Disney, because we make a lot of children's games. Um, but but I think for everyone, there there is a sea change coming in kind of how data will be allowed to be collected and how you're allowed to use it. And so systems and tools that let you kind of safeguard privacy while allowing you to make good business decisions from it. This is sort of increasingly a, important. This is a top line item of, of what we deliver. In fact, we even have a team of people called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Engineers. Um, and their job is actually to understand uh, what the lay of the land is in terms of both regulation and convention mm -hmm. and figure out what features we need to build to support that. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of the problem, going back to what you were talking because actually the privacy and civil liberties issue is bound up in the access control issue. They're kind of one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it took us probably about three to four engineering years. It was a, maybe a six month sprint to, to take what we, had, what we had taken as our base level data store and put in a very sophisticated ACL system that lets us deal with things like multi-classification environments um, and censoring data for different user populations. One of the things that we built in, I think, that, that um, we're, a place where we're innovating around this is something called discovery permissions. Mm -hmm. um, and this, is, this allows you to actually take a set of data and make it available to a population of users who can query against it, but they can't see the results without justifying access to it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you have something like, um, 
uh, just like a lot of phone records or something like that, and someone wants to say, well, do we, has this person ever called, right? And so they can search, and what they get back is a message that says, there are, there are results that matched your search. Go through this out-of-band process to get access to them. And in a law enforcement context, that might be you need to get a warrant to get access to this mm -hmm. information. Uh, in, in a corporate context, it may just be you need to provide a business justification or anything like that. And, and so it, it, it has the nice property of walking that line of giving people access to all the data they need, right. but avoiding their ability to actually abuse that data by giving them carte blanche yeah. access to begin with. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's shift a little bit. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of us that are solving problems for individual companies, you know, there's a lot of, of different uh, solutions out there, knocking on the door. I'll ask uh, Rajiv and Dave here, you know, what are you looking for? What, what do you value most when a uh, startup shows up and says, hey, uh, can we talk? Um, what, are you, what are you looking for? What do you value there in that interaction? So for us, I mean, we're working with a lot of startups. As I said, I mean, there are a lot of gaps today in the tech stack and, and the visualization area. And a couple of things we're looking for. I mean, obviously, I mean, they have a good product to start with, but also uh, ability to partner very closely and be able to deliver quick. I mean, markets evolving so quickly. I mean, things are changing. Um, being at Netflix, I mean, we roll out products every two to three weeks. We have a couple of hundred experiments running any given time. And, and speed for us is very, very important. So when we work with these companies, with these uh, entrepreneurs and uh, startups, we're looking for good partners who understand our problem quickly and are able to iterate and, and kind of adapt to our style. Yeah, I, I think that's key for us too. I've, we're lurk, working with less startups than we used to because a lot of them got acquired by right. bigger companies, so they're <laughs> right. no longer startups. Um, but but uh, time to market is, is important because uh, the mobile market uh, changes so quickly that we have to constantly change the data collecting and processing infrastructure. Um, and so we, we need partners in that space to, to be fast as well. Uh, and they actually have to be in that space to, to survive. Um, and then, I, th I mean, I think the other thing that's important is like to be really honest about what, what the product does and where the limitations are, because we're always, you know, we talk to lots of people who are developing algorithms and they go, 98% accurate, and we're like, no, it isn't. It's like, you really, you know, like, like we know that there's nothing perfect and nothing we build is perfect e either for, on the data side, and so we're, you know, we're pushing and poking. We just want to know, like, where, where we can really trust something and where we should be more careful, and, and so, like having a very honest dialogue, I think, is, is key. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. Uh, I came from the solution, or the, you know, the, software, the enterprise software uh, industry before going in-house with Wells Fargo, and it's been very different to see the, the different perspectives. And, and one of those things, I think, the trust, um, the openness of the dialogue, I, I value a lot more than feature function that they, they may have. And um, also, you know, I notice how they, how they may protect the relationships with their other customers. If, mm -hmm. if they, you know, are they? That's a good point. Are they yeah. going to? Uh, are they going to expose what I'm doing to them? I, I'm watching how they're protecting those relationships as well. Um, but in addition to, you know, clearly solutions, you know, what they've done, how they're going about it, how fast they're moving, um, the types of team that they, uh, team members and and the talent they're bringing to bear. So, um, but uh, it's it's a it's a certainly um, a, a ton of opportunity and there's uh, some great minds certainly at work and it's, it's, it's exciting to, to interact there. Um, any, any concluding thoughts? We're, we're at the end of the session. Any, any uh, concluding uh, remarks? Um, Ari and the others for, uh, for this group? I mean, the, the only thing I would say is for, for entrepreneurs, people are trying to figure out how to attack the big data space. Um, I think a lot of the ways in which we've seen smaller companies uh, add value is to identify a, a particular problem that, that is shared across a whole, a whole vertical mm -hmm. uh, and go down deep on it, right? So this, it, and it completely relates to the talent crunch. It's like anything that you can do where you can come up with a package solution that completely solves or mostly solves a problem uh, for a set of customers, if it means that they don't have to hire five or six people to implement it themselves and do all that, that's huge. And, and I think it's gonna get a, a great reception out in the market. I just say, I mean, um, there's a lot of hype around it, and the, the big data word gets thrown around a lot, but it is real. And I, being at Netflix, how it's being leveraged, and more and more companies are 
realizing that's what they need to do in order to deliver uh, an outstanding product. So I'd say it's real and uh, keep, stay focused at it and uh, it, it's a big opportunity. And, and just to wrap that in the talent discussion, there's no better place to learn about the problems that the big companies are facing than to go in and work at one of the big companies that's hiring, like I'm sure we all are, um, and really experience the problems and then go, I can solve that for everyone. I'm going to go start up something. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now there are real opportunities. This is, this is not just uh, climbing the hype cycle. This is, this is a real disruptive um, set of real technologies that are very exciting, very interesting, and there's all sorts of opportunities around, as we mentioned, technology, talent, specific solutions. I think the more specific you can get the solution, yeah. the more my ears perk up uh, yeah. versus the, the generalists out there. Yeah. Um, but I think the, one, one yeah. contrast, too, that might be important here in other areas of entrepreneurship, you know, if you look at the whole sort of startup ecosystem and stuff, it's actually a lot of business model innovation on the back of sort, yeah. sort of some light technology work, and here it's inverted, right? It's, it's actually, this is, this is hardcore engineering that you yep. need to understand, you need to do when they call it data science. Yes, there's an artistry to it. Yes, uh, there needs to be some nice visualization to it, but there's actually a lot of science to it, and it requires yep. a deep understanding of the math, how you're generating signal, all of these things. It's actually less about how well you market the business and more about what That's the right. capabilities are that you can create. Yeah. Thank you so much to Ari, Rajiv, Dave, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to be with you today and appreciate your attention. Thanks for uh, coming to, to TyCon. Thank you.